Good evening, welcome, and this is our second episode, season one of Conclave. I'm Shudeep Sen from New Delhi. It's 9, 9.40 at night, and my co-host... Yeah, I'm Fiona Sampson. We haven't got that bit quite smooth yet. We haven't been doing this on the breakfast sofa for long enough, and it's 10 past four in the afternoon in rural Herefordshire in England. And Don is in Washington, D.C. Don does the technicals. So we will start uh, this uh, evening with Arthur Z, followed by Marilla and then Sean O'Brien. And Arthur and Marilla will be introduced by Fiona and uh, Sean O'Brien will be introduced by me. Uh, everyone has 15 minutes to read. After each reader, uh, the hosts uh, just intervene and ask maybe a question or a comment. And when the entire thing is done, we have a proper discussion amongst the host and, and, the, and the readers themselves. So welcome, Arthur. And please use the chat box, as I've said, generously. I'll be putting all the information up there and share your books information <laughs> and links and so on and so forth. Welcome, Arthur. Welcome, Arthur. Um, and welcome, Marilla Alexandre, and welcome, Sean O'Brien. Um, so this afternoon, we're going to talk about, um, or really, you're going to talk about poetry and politics. And we've tried to be really capacious with all our topics so that we have, I mean, a range of wonderful poets whose work speaks to each other across cultures as well as across geographies. Um, you know, elective affinities is definitely our watchword. And some of our guests in the series know each other. Some of them know guests from other episodes. Um, all of them are friends of ours um, and much admired colleagues in one way or another. Um, some of us haven't met for in the room for over 10 years. Some of us have met really recently. Um, so I hope that what's gonna happen this afternoon, I'm sure this is Shadeep's hope too, is that gradually some just very loose sense of the potentialities of poetry for moving in and out of the political sphere, moving in and out of questions about identity, culture building, cultural belonging, culture making are going to wax and wane. Um, I am now, it's great privilege to introduce Arthur who's wonderful uh, new and collected poems is just coming out. I hope you can see it there. I hope I'm aligning it all well enough with the, um, the camera from Copper Canyon, The Glass Constellation, and a wonderful title for a, a wonderful book and an incredibly apt title too. Arthur, I'm going to embarrass you by reading your bio note. So Arthur, as we probably all know, is a poet, translator and editor. He's the author of 11 books of poetry, including the Glass Constellation, New and Collected, Sightlines 2019, which received the National Book Award, Compass Rose 2014, a Pulitzer Prize finalist, Ginkgo Light 2009, Selected of the Penn Southwest Book Award, and Mountains and Plains Independent Booksellers Association Book Award, Kweepu, The Red Shifting Web, Selected for the Balcon Poetry Prize and the Asian American Literary Award, and Archipelago 1995, Selected for an American Book Award. He's also published a book of Chinese poetry translations, The Silk Dragon, in 2001, which was selected for the Western States Book Award. And he edited Chinese Writers on Writing in 2010. Thank you, Shadim. <laughs> it's, I love having, I have, we, we should all pull everything off our bookshelves. Uh, it's fantastic. A recipient of the Jackson Poetry Prize from Poets and Writers, a Lannan Literary Award, a Guggenheim, a Lila Wallace Readers Digest Writers Award, two National Endowment for the Arts Creative Writing Fellowships. C so was the first poet laureate of Santa Fe, New, New Mexico. From 2012 to 2017, he was Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, and in 2017, elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His poems have been translated into over a dozen languages, including Chinese, Dutch, German, Korean, and Spanish. He's Professor Emeritus at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Um, I believe that Sean and Arta, well, I'm sure they will tell you this themselves, met through the agency of Yang Lian, our guest last time in um, China. 
And Arta and I also met through the agency of Yang Lian. So many thanks to Yang Lian, who's in a sense a co-host for this um, episode too. Arta, it's a huge privilege and pleasure to have you here. And I know we're really going to enjoy this reading. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fiona, Shudeep, and Don for making this reading, international reading possible. It's such a pleasure and honor to be reading with Sean and Mary Lar. Uh, it's 9.15 in the morning in Santa Fe, New Mexico. So we're at all hours of the day, afternoon, and evening. Um, I think my, I'm going to read six poems. And uh, in terms of how they fit with poetry and politics, I want to let the poems speak for themselves. Uh, in a few instances, I'm going to set a, a, a little context for them. But I'm just going to go ahead and read. Uh, this first poem is called First Snow. A rabbit has stopped on the gravel driveway, imbibing the silence. You stare at spruce needles. There's no sound of a leaf blower, no sign of a black bear. A few weeks ago, a buck scraped his rack against an aspen trunk. A carpenter scribed a plank along a curved stone wall. You only spot the rabbit's ears and tail. When it moves, you locate it against speckled gravel. But when it stops, it blends in again. The world of being is like this gravel. You think you own a car, a house, this blue zigzagged shirt but you just borrow these things. Yesterday, you constructed an aqueduct of dreams and stood at Gibraltar, but you possess nothing. Snow melts into a pool of clear water. And in this stillness, starlight behind daylight, wherever you gaze. Beautiful, beautiful. This next poem is set in China, um, a China that you wouldn't recognize today. It's really China in the mid 1980s after the Cultural Revolution, and it's called The Negative. A man hauling coal in the street is stilled forever. Inside a temple, instead of light, a slow shudder lets the darkness in. I see a rat turn a corner running from a man with a chair trying to smash it. See people sleeping at midnight in a Wuhan street on bamboo beds. A dead pig floating, bloated on water. I see a photograph of a son smiling who two years ago fell off a cliff and his photograph is in each room of the apartment. I meet a woman who had smallpox as a child, was abandoned by her mother, but who lived, now has two daughters, a son, a son-in-law. They live in three rooms and watch a color television. I see a man in blue work clothes whose father was a peasant who joined the Communist Party early, but by the time of the Cultural Revolution had risen in rank and become a target of the Red Guards. I see a woman who tried to kill herself with an acupuncture needle, but instead hit a vital point and cured her chronic asthma. A Chinese poet argues that the fundamental difference between East and West is that in the East, an individual does not believe himself in control of his fate but yields to it. As a negative reverses light and dark, these words are prose accounts of personal tragedy becoming metaphor. An emulsion of silver salts sensitive to light. Laughter in the underground bomb shelter converted into a movie theater. Lovers in the summer palace park.
This next poem moves more apropos to America. It's called Black Center. Green tips of tulips are rising out of the earth. You don't flense a whale or fire at beer cans in an arroyo, but catch the budding tips of pear branches and wonder what it's like to live along a purling edge of spring. Jefferson once tried to assemble a mastodon skeleton on the White House floor, but with pieces missing, failed to sequence the bones. When the last speaker of a language dies, a hue vanishes from the spectrum of visible light. Last night you sped past revolving and flashing red, blue, and white lights along the road, a wildfire in the dark. Though no one you knew was taken in the midnight ambulance, an arrow struck a bullseye and quivered in its shaft. One minute gratitude rises like water from an underground lake. Another dissolution gnaws from a black center. <clears throat> this next poem is said uh, in Hawaii, actually, on the big island along the Kona coast. And it's called Cloud Forest. And uh, there's one line, uh, because this is an international reading, I'm just going to make a little notation. There's one line, we find these truths to be self-evident, which is a riff off of the um, founding fathers. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Cloud Forest. Against the mountain slope, incoming fog. We stood near the maroon strips of bark and inhaled the aroma of a rainbow eucalyptus. In the Netherlands, a rising sea level is stressing dikes and a capa is singing. Waves were white capping against black lava rock. On an atoll, Nuclear waste was dumped into a concrete vault. We find these truths to be self-evident. In a past life, I played the clarinet in a marching band. Now the vault has cracked. Have we not meandered, bewildered in a cloud forest along this coast? You are tracing the contours of desire. The pilot veers the helicopter up over the canyon rim as we gasp. The Amaui has vanished. We step into red ginger daylight. Stunning, stunning, beautiful. This next poem is a change of pace, is called Lichen Song, and it's written from the point of view of a little piece of lichen stuck up in a ceiling board when, when a person steps out of the shower and the lichen speaks to the human being. Lichen Song. Snow in the air. You've seen a crust on the ceiling wood and never considered how I gather moisture when you step out of the shower. You don't care that I respire as you breathe. For years, you've washed your face, gazed in the mirror, shaved, combed your hair, rushed out, while I, who may grow an inch in a thousand years, catch the tingling sunlight. You don't understand how I can dive to a temperature of liquefied gas and warm back up, absorb water, start growing again without a scar. I can float numb in space, be hit with cosmic rays, then return to Earth and warm out of my sleep to respire again without a hiccup. You come and go while I stay gripped to pine, 
and the sugar of existence runs through you, runs through me, you sliver if you just go, go, go. If you slowed, you could discover mosquitoes bat their wings 600 times a second, and before they mate, synchronize their wings, you could feel how they flicker with desire. I am flinging your words, and if you absorb not block my song, you could learn you are not alone in pain and grief, though you've instilled pain and grief. You can urge the dare and thrill of bliss if and when you stop to look at a rock at a fence post, but you cough, only look, yes, look at me now, because you are blink about to leave. And uh, this last poem is called Sight Lines. It's set in Northern New Mexico, about 20 miles north of Santa Fe, uh, here where I live. And in this valley, there are a lot of uh, irrigation ditches. We're off one river, there are ditches that channel water and feed irrigation fields. And to the west, if you're walking in this valley, up on a mesa on a flat top, you can see Los Alamos, the birthplace of the atom bomb. And this last poem will move through space and time. It's written in one line stanzas, so there's silence between the lines. And it's a form I invented. Each line picks up a word or words from the previous line, and that includes the title, Sight Lines. I'm walking in sight of the Rio Nambe. Salt cedar rises through silt in an irrigation ditch. The snowpack in the Sangre de Cristos has already dwindled before spring. At least no fires erupt in the conifers above Los Alamos. The plutonium waste has been hauled to an underground site. The man who built plutonium triggers breeds horses now. No one could anticipate this distance from Monticello. Jefferson despised newspapers, but no one thing takes us out of ourselves. During the Cultural Revolution, a boy saw his mother shot in front of a firing squad. A woman detonates when a spam text triggers bombs strapped to her body. When I come to an upright circular steel lid, I step out of the ditch. I step out of the ditch, but step deeper into myself. I arrive at a space that no longer needs autumn or spring. I find ginseng where there is no ginseng, my talisman of desire. Though you are visiting Paris, you are here at my fingertips. Though I step back into the ditch, no whitening cloud dispels this world's mystery. The ditch ran before the year of the Louisiana Purchase. I'm walking on silt glimpsing horses in the field, fielding the shapes of our bodies in white sand. Though parallel lines touch in the infinite, the infinite is here. Thank you. Bravo. That was that was really really stunning, uh, Arthur. Thank you. Um, one of the things I just want to say quickly: this is the book I was I first had. This was my introduction to your poetry. This was a way. This was a while back, of course, probably in the nineties, I think. Yes. Um, now you have this sort of huge compendium that's coming out, which I'm looking forward to seeing. You know, whenever I read your poems on the page. Uh, of course, your poems are very, very lyrical, very exact. The phraseology is really uh, pitch perfect and sharp. 
But when I read them on the page, I know you're lyrical as a poet, but I use a different kind of music. And I hear a different kind of music when I read the poems. What is surprising and unsurprising is the fact that when you read them, you will sound like an American poet reading poetry. <laughs> Uh -huh. Which was, it's a bit, a bit of an odd thing because the musicality that is embedded in your poetry is quite in contrast to the American cadence of reading. I was wondering whether you could say something quickly about that. Um, yeah, I think, well, at least for a while, American poets had a tendency to when they read their poems to sort of go up at the end of a line, mm -hmm. they were kind of like yes. a rise and fall. And um, I felt like, I don't know where that came from, but I felt like that really wasn't letting the language, the musicality of the language come from within. It was more like an expectation or it became a kind of style that was very popular at uh, readings. And um, I felt over time, I mean, I've tried my own sort of reading voices changed, but I think at this stage I'm more relaxed and I'm more interested in letting the sort of textures of sound uh, in each word in English. And maybe because, you know, I grew up speaking Chinese first in New York City and then learned English that my handling of English is a little different than a lot of American poets. But, you know, so I find I'm most interested in bringing, allowing the sort of sound uh, and rhythm of the words to come out from inside and to maybe slow the pace down. And I also like to have a lot more sort of silence between the phrases because, my poems tend to be very rich with imagery. And if I read them too quickly or read them in a kind of narrative that a lot of maybe American poets do, they get too compressed or jumbled up or pushed next to each other. And I feel like my poems need a little more, a slower pace, a little more breathing room and a little more attention to silence. Thank you. That's such a fascinating thing to say. Thank you. And, and such a wonderful reading, I mean, and I'm, I suppose I'm thinking the same thing as Shadeep, but in a slightly different way, which is that I always feel, I felt it listening to you, but I also feel it when I'm reading you, although I agree with Shadeep, the music is different for me as a reader. Um, there's, it's the wrong word, it's, stealthy is the wrong word, but there's a sense of apparently there's just tremendous stillness and lucidity but my goodness, suddenly there are these depth charges and you do this tremendous conceptual and, and particularly in these poems, very political work, but you bring it in as if you have, nothing has moved, but actually you've brought in all this material. And, and doing that, you kind of show us that experience all the world or isness is kind of geological like that. It's simultaneous and there's this stillness, but actually my goodness, there's so much weight underneath the, the still water on the top. That's mixed metaphors all over the place. But you know oh, I mean. Well, thank you. No, that's a huge compliment. Thank you. I mean, it's very overt in a poem like Lycan where you you join up the 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 motion and you show the conceptual motion. But a lot of the time, you make a statement and then you make the statement that underlies that lies under that, and then you state the underlying thing and then you state the underlying thing. This is extraordinarily powerful and cumulative. I, often yeah, I think, I think that the, the sort of just juxtaposition between lightness and density is remarkable because it's light at one level and it's beautifully calibrated and weighted, but the phrases and what you're trying to convey is, you know, it's like this volcanic mass, you know, it's full of ionic particles, so to speak. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you. Thank you, Arthur. That was beautiful. Thank you. We'll yes, come back again. So yeah. Marilla is our next poet, and Shadeep is just about to put up your biographical note, Marilla. Um, it's a huge pleasure to and honor to introduce Mar Marilla Alexandre, the Galician poet and writer. Marilla and I met in Santiago de Compostela in ooh, 2009, something like that. Um, and we met really for a very short time, but Marilla made such an impression on me, um, both her writing and her thinking about Galician culture making and then poetry and, and women's writing in general, that I've just remained full of admiration and we stayed in touch. 
Um, and I'm going to read the your bio note, Mar Marilla, but um, it's always very difficult, I think, talking about the political importance of a woman writer because that can, if you're not careful, be reductive. And I don't see why it should be reductive, but um, writing as a woman is, should not be a political act. And yet it seems to me that it is, and that you could write practically anything as a woman, and that would still be a political act in today's overwhelmingly gendered um, literary world. Um, Marilla, I'm going to introduce you by reading your bio note now. Marilla Alexandre learned to write from drafting tracts for underground journals. She claims to have a forked tongue. Such are the risks of licking blood from knives, but she needed it in order to write in Galician. And actually, I grew up in Wales, where we also say, which is a bilingual country, English and Welsh, and we say that the dragon, which is the Welsh symbol, speaks with a forked tongue. So um, from these split identities, she does research about critical thinking in the University of Santiago de Compostela. She also writes poetry and has been granted a number of awards for a catalogue of poisons or shiftings, a rewriting of Ovid's metamorphoses in women's voices. Her fiction includes her last novel, Bad Women, 2021, set in a women's prison in the 19th century. And um, she, her fiction for young people, Head of a Medusa, which is uh, published by Small Stations Press, deals with the social violence and ostracization that follows rape. It's a very, um, shocking and very lucid um, piece of fiction. Her work has been collected in English anthologies, The Wind in Our Sails, Migrant Shores, and Bregan's Lighthouse, which although I can't pronounce it, I have on my, my bookshelf. Sometimes, she says, one of her several voices gets stuck in her throat like the bones of fishes that Galician people eat, head, tail, and all. It's a huge pleasure to welcome you, Marilla. Thank you for joining us. Well, first, uh, thank you. Thank you, Fiona and Sudeb for making this possible. Uh, I'm going to read by, um, first from my book, A Catalog of Poisons. And uh, it was my first volume. And when I uh, gave it to my father, he said, that my mother used to write poems, but afterwards she was tearing them up. Uh, and uh, this uh, book is um, about the tensions between uh, the women and mothers. So, derrotas domésticas. Debe ser muy difícil de olar las anguillas en cortar los dedos. Arrandearte para que no te cubrisen las escamas de hoy amor. Liscardo no corredío de las habas. Las noites opacas, qué batallas contra los garabanzos medrando disformes en la Qué absurda tarefa escoger dentellas de arroz. Qué impotencia cuando el leite fervido va por fuera inevitablemente. Es si bate fondo de las tisolas, no se deis a oír la música. Soto francés y alemán eran inútiles contra grasa en los fogos. Sus tubos de agua berran como nenos o gaivotas y las patacas se pegan en no el fondo de la tarteira. Nay, ¿cómo es que está sorriendo en las fotos? Eh, from the same volume. Marilla, eh, I'm just going to pause you there a moment because. Um... I am not sure whether that was po poem was among the translations that you sent to Don, was it? No, it's the first one. Ah. Um, the ro um, domestic defeats. I'm looking at Don, I'm giving Don eye contact just to... No. Yes. Uh, no, the... Oh, this is Fernando Carrera. It's, it's a different uh, document, right. what you're showing. Here we go. Here we go. Um, keep going down. Oh, OK. Do you want me to send you, it? Do you think it's in there? Don, maybe I apologize. Oh, yeah. the, Let's the look through and see if this is correct. Uh, OK. No. The, 
No, this is not me. This is no. <laughs> this is different Mama poet. Tavia Real is another poet. Yes. Ah, Keep going I... down, Don, in case that Jennifer has just put it all in one document, rather. Okay, so. Uh... We have violin and silencio, silent violin. No, this is not mine. Ah, uh, no. sorry, my mistake then, or or Jennifer's. Do you want me to send it again? That would be great. Yes. That would be wonderful. Thank you, Marilla. Uh, okay, excuse me. I will get a moment into. Uh, I, do, should I send it to? Okay. Do you have Don in the group email? Because Don is the. Uh, oh, I have here. Should I? And Fiona? Then send to us and we'll send straight to Don. And... Mary Laura. Oh, okay, Don Krieger, I have it here. Yes, so you can just reply to that one. <laughs> <laughs> I actually saw that it it didn't look it, it didn't quite register with me that it wasn't you. I didn't quite understand the, the document though. Uh, it, do you have it? Not yet. Just send Give us a shout when you sent it, Myla. Ah, here it is. Oh, great. OK, It'll only that in the document, uh, th there, there is first the poem in Galician and then in, uh, and then in English. Yes. So, it, so it'll take, it, it always takes a moment to open it. Well, uh, as I was saying, you know, the, the problems of having forked tongues yes. are apparent when you are... Ready. Exactly what I was thinking, yes. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I just wanted to um, add a small note, which is that, you know, uh, Head of Medusa is published by Small Stations Press, which is in Bulgaria. And yeah. in the press of Jonathan Dunn and Sveta Elenkova, and Sveta Elenkova is reading in our series in oh, May, oh, June. Oh, oh. And Jonathan is a translator both from Bulgarian and from Galician. Very interesting combination. Oh, is this it? Yeah, yeah, this is me, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So I, uh, perhaps I will skip the, the next because we have less time. Um, no. Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite, Nola. I think that you should probably. Well, okay. So I'm almost tempted to say you should read from the beginning again because you know it's 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 a shame you didn't have the translation. But certainly from the second poem, please don't feel you should go short. Yes, okay, this, one, no. this one comment. This this doesn't look like Spanish like the other one did. No, it's got exactly. a Spanish, very similar, but <laughs> so domestic defeats. Then. Lovely. Thank you. Debe ser muy difícil degolar las sanguías en cortar los dedos, arrandearte para que no te cubrisen las escamas de olomón, liscardo no corredío das sabas, las noites opacas que batallas contra los garabanzos medrando disformes na auda, que absurda tarefa escoller lentellas de arroz, que impotencia cuando el leite fervido va por fuera inevitablemente. Ese batifondo de las tisolas, la ancha de Isaba y la música. Si otro francés y alemán eran inútiles contra grasa en los fogones. Si los tubos de agua berran como nenos o gaibotas y las patacas se pegan en el fondo de la tarteira, nay, como que estás sorriendo en las fotos. And, uh, from the same book, uh, by sus uñas. A noite antes de morreres, ordes do médico, con algo donciño mollado en acetona, borrei da uña do teu dedo pequeno o esmalte rosa. O ano antes de morreres, eu tiña 25. Estaba tan ocupada en non ser como a ti, non criar sete fillos, 
borrar los esmaltes de todas las uñas, escapar los vincallos que tenden a las cuncas de café. A noite antes, o esmalte en algodón, que un médico puede severo de balar de sangre por baixo de las uñas, las caracolas brancas, última mare valeirándose en el corazón, mientras la muerte atuñaba por la cana de los osos. O ano antes, un amante que no conocías, de conocerlo, habías de gustarte. Atendía o balbordo que me zoaba dentro de los caracoles. Pintó un mena uña de dedo pequeño con rotulador negro un corazón. De aquella no sabía que te un sangre cayó en esa tierra que tenía bajo las uñas, que a ti debía las púas que aromaban, que también llevo por bajo las uñas restos de tu tinta que acabaría usurpando te una me. No sabía que fuches ti que me educó contra ti misma. And the next poem, um, uh, a diario, um, is uh, part of the impulse to write uh, this, this book because it was a small book that my mother, and at that time, the diary, At that time, mothers sometimes would write for their children, uh, but adopting the, the first person. So she was writing this until I was eight. And this is the last entry uh, that is in italics. I tenho bastante mal senio. Aquí acabo el diario. Acertaches, poniendo punto después de la contundente descripción. Es rabuda como a mí, fui de hecho escribir. No aceptas en protestar que o lunes siga o domingo. Ni negociaría como Brancaneves un acogo o precio de cocinar, lavar, coser y calcetar. E impaciente en más. Usas palabras para cortar. Tesoiras mal afiadas. Do espello copia o meu desdén. No tengo a relación con las esquinas dos muebles que le meten cambadelas. He de a marcas negras dos seus beliscos. Herdó de mí os osos pequeños. A mauva, a lingua gallada. A tinta o veleno que le brotaba y sus uñas ven de muy atrás. Y ainda que se negue a reconocerlo, fue eu que ya aprendió a enfiar palabras. And uh, uh, from this same volume, uh, O labirinto de bambú. Desconfía do labirinto de bambú. Bambú labirinto. Desconfía do labirinto de bambú. O se cana lanzado. Mañana barrote. La suba multitud de especies. Eh, then, eh, from another volume eh, that is related to a house that has been. Eh, inhabited by the last five centuries, as happened in Galicia, but now for the first time, nobody is living there, only people on the weekends. Barreras cinzas. No lar morrerá o lume prendido hai catro séculos, e non vou recoller o tizón caído da tua man, pai. A noite barrerei as cinzas, ainda que escorrente as ánimas dos antepasados, esgazando de los callos de lembranzas. Se a chemineo cala sus palabras de fume, gritando en silencio a soledad de la casa, no me tome la requesta, porque a mí, de cinco hermanos, los rachones no un yar agromarán nuevas raíces, volverán a termar la tierra sin ningún que os queme. La cocina que o lume no enquece, ainda bate o eco de tu voz, Lendo libro tras libro, plantando en nos semente de vento. And from the same uh, volume, and again about a house that well, nobody is living and nobody is gathering the apples. As mazas reprochan desde a herba. Doce podremia de cadáveres de mazas esmagadas. Rubia carne de feridos, nueva guerra, fuera de la horta, reventadas por la espoleta de ausencia. 
una maza rompe desde dentro. Así es guizan los cerebros. Tanto ten que arden baixa tona, sabedoría o pecado. Na horta no quedan cobras. E ni sequer las abellas fueron avisadas cuando cumplía. Caeron las mazas porque su tiempo era pasado. Desde a herba aberran no se reproches. Um, now from um, from shiftings is a rewriting of uh, Ovid Metamorphoses, but taking the women voice in the kitchen territory, territorio da cocina. And it has a verb, a verse from Ovid. Parte chimpan en fondos caldeiros, parte estrada nos espetos, o cuarto pinga sangre. Dice Ovid. A cocina fue decretada o teu territorio para que en ella gobernases la geometría de las patacas, o alineamiento de las tijolas, o estricto calibre de la farina. Ningún disputa progne o adubo de los anacos de su fillo antes de espetarlo en el asadero para un venganza contra Tereo, para otros sino de hospitalidad. Entonces, ¿contra quién toma la requesta? Se te esas más anoadas en los panos de mesa. Los cortes en tus dedos son testemunhas de amor. A cebola en nada más a causa de las bagullas. Ti mesma levantaches espeques con garfos. Cuando amorosamente piques en anaquiños os dedos a orellas, rustrindos con prisel e urego. Cuando mestures o sangre no amorado las filloas, no deises de situar no medio de la fonte los delicados peitos, te aduga los sexo con especias, o teu xeito. a cocina e o teu territorio, o teu reino. And uh, from the same volume, uh, Circe, tu Odiseus, uh, from Ovid. Comencé a inzarme de sedas y e a no poder falar, a emitir en troques de fala un rouco murmurio. Endureceuse a miña boca, converténdose en corvo fucín. Son eu, a sabedora, a que escoita a voz do abruñeiro, a que doma ortiga y e escancia o zume da datura, a que debulla as augas das nubes, e racha o ventre do nordesco fuciño de lata. Son eu. A destemida, a que se adianta las propuestas de los hombres, a la cama abierta que guía los formigos por las tuas costas, navegando entre velas de sabas. Nada puse en nuestros marineros que no estives en ellos. Pise en los bedoiros, contemplaron o porco que levaban dentro, gruñiron con voz verdadera, gozaron la tierra, siguiendo su inclinación. Y cuando desertes o me obleito, en marches salundes, cachende ardas tuas conquistas, las tuas raposadas, procurarás en van, desface la marca invisible, la miña lengua, la tua pe. And also from this uh, volume, eh, comedores de cabezas, and this is truly because. Uh, more difficult for me that to learn Galician was to learn to eat the head of the fishes that like Chinese people, uh, Galician people eat. O comer cabezas de peixe, reconhecémonos entre nosotros por fillos das náyades. Nas veas levamos salitre. Usámoslo as veces para fabricar pólvora. E dos bultos a cardondas orellas nos días de temporal, nada digas, son garlas. O como un garco a las cabezas del peixe, reclamamos la herdanza de las espiñas, hacemos las nosas gorcha abaixo, ve arriba, atravesando no se oeixe sutil palabras de un poema. Hubo un tiempo en que comíamos peixe cru e respirábamos nauga. Compartíamos simetría pentámera con aurizos y estrellas. 
nada vamos más veloces que las luras. Ahora, para cruzar la auga, debemos confiarnos, no nos des las velas. And, um, uh, uh, because I don't know about time, I'm going to read uh, two more poems. Um, That's perfect, Marla. That perfect. Are, two more, yeah. Two more that are unpublished. So, um, so please, if you go to, um, I don't always rip up poems. Uh, I, I will skip Babel. Later, if we have time, we can read it. And uh, next, okay, that one in English. And uh, says Olvido García Valdés, is a great Spanish poet. El poema, como el paisaje. No, is is that one. Uh, the, the ripping, the, the ripping one, before that one, uh, Sudep. Um, the English is, I don't always, that, that one. So this is Olvido. El poema como el paisaje es lugar donde se nos permite hablar con los muertos. This is Olvido, García Valdés. Escribir a, po, a procura dos poemas que rachabas, como a auga brollando en area. Tal vez florezan sombras entre las líneas, como agua, o un reverso de papel usado en el forro de los libros. Era muerte a palabra. De cote advertías, he morrer pronto, poboando de medos a noite. Escribiendo en el reverso, a veces, pestanes a una sombra, o reflexos esquivos, la distancia sobre el mar. Din que teños tú as más, se no las miro, se si has de eso escribir soas, tal vez, tal vez. Con pastilla de tinta chinesa, do mercado de Su Chu, trazo caracteres incomprensibles, o no haber ningún, casi ningún a que no mentir. Al final, sin saber por qué os rachabas, onde os fragmentos, sin saber. And then I will skip Nete and uh, so go to Fora do Casulo, out of the cocoon. This is for a collective, uh, yeah, in English. Fora do Casulo. Esgazalo Casulo tengo seus riscos. Ano, 1976. Nel y agravado, destino inexorable. Nai. Nay, nay. Os criterios para ser mujer completa, marcas alumen a pel. No proceso de metamorfose as entrañas disolvense, no una marfallada de células, fluidos, hormonas, o resultado de incerto. Una mujer, sin más adjetivos. Una mujer, definida en por sí. Fuera de casulo, todo es incerteza. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Marila. I mean, what's always strikes me about your work is the um, the ferocity of the imagery. None of this kind of scented linen cupboard for you. I mean, you know, I love the the notion of the apples. You know burst by the, by the fuse of absence, that kind of sense of, well, and all the, the Ovidian transformations. Um, one doesn't have to be an analyst to know that in intimate relationships, the violence starts in intimate relationships, but my goodness, you really track it for us. It's just wonderful stuff. Shadi, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think the one which, the one poem, at least I, I was I was marking out bits I like, and there were so many actually, but the one that encapsulates Marilla, your sense of community documenting of history or personal documenting of history or politics is this bit where you say, my forked tongue, the ink or poison that flows from her fingernails comes from way back. And even if she, won't admit it, 
It was I who taught her how to string words. Just simply brilliant how you sort of, you know, compact it and make it so powerful in a sense. And it all comes back to the whole idea of the politics of words itself in a sense. So yes, thank you. That was wonderful, really enjoyed it. Well, thank you. You know, the thing is that many women in my generation had a very fraught relationship with their mothers. And my mother died when I was really young. I was 25. So in fact, it was afterwards <clears throat> that I was able to reflect on the... <coughs> Sorry. On how uh, a young woman marrying at 19, um, bringing uh, seven children, uh, uh, how in a way in this volume she is presented as Snow White, but after, what happens to Snow White afterwards? Mm. Yes. I wonder how many women writers don't have mothers or who ha have problematic mothers. I wonder whether there's a kind of, you know, we all know about the anxiety of influence in the male succession, the Oedipal struggle. I wonder how much that applies for women. No, but uh, probably, apparently, uh, I think that many of us in, in Spain and everywhere have uh, a good affective emotional relation with uh, the mother, but then there is uh, a tension well, because, um, for instance, at that time in Spain, it was not possible to go to bed with your boyfriend. And then there was the politics and uh, all these things. And it's only after a time that you uh, realize that it was, uh, well, uh, I, I, I am uh, what she, she did. I mean, she brought me up against herself probably, but, uh, but it was too late. I couldn't tell her because she has been there for many years. But uh, um, usually more poems about mothers are more on the side, uh, very affective, positive. So uh, I think that it, we have a, also to acknowledge the, the other part. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you so much, Mary and I. I have so much I could say, and I'm not going to. I'm going to shut up and hand over to Shadeep and Sean. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mary and I. Uh, a final poet is Sean O'Brien. Uh, I've just put up the long bio on the side, on the chat box. Sean, it's a real pleasure to see you, finally. We haven't met in person. I've met you many, many times on the page, not just in your book of poems, but in your anthologies and and one of the things I really admire about you is that you equally balance your poetic side and your side as a critic. I think that's such an important sort of bipolar thing that not too many poets have. So that's a real, real source of uh, pleasure and also information when you're watching British poetry and Irish poetry from far away. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you. Let me read out the formal bio slightly shortened version. Uh, Sean O'Brien's 10th collection of poems, it says here, was published by Picador in 2020. His collected poems appeared in 2012. His work has received awards, including the T.S. Eliot and Forward Prizes, the Somerset Maugham, Chumley, and E.M. Foster Awards, and the Roehampton Poetry Prize, as well as the Novosad International Writers Award, and the European Lyric Atlas Award. His work has been translated into languages including Chinese, Dutch, Serbo-Croat, and Spanish. His novel, Once Again Assembled Here, was published in 2016, and his collection of short stories, Courtier Perdue, in 2018. He's also the translator of works including The Birds, Inferno, uh, Spanish Golden Age plays and others. In 2017, he was the Weidenfeld Professor of Com Comparative Literature 
Comparative European Literature at St. Anne's College in Oxford. He's currently Professor of Creative Writing at Newcastle University and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. He lives in Newcastle upon time, I think the home of Blood Axe Books. Um, and welcome, Sean. There are lots of uh, admirers sitting up at 10.30 in India waiting to listen to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be taking part in this imaginative enterprise. Uh, and I, I commend it in its, um, the largeness of its imaginative undertaking. I shall read seven poems, the last of which is tiny and about two lines long. Um, the first poem is called It Says Here and is the title poem of my most recent book. Um, it's a poem about the way in which childhood reading shapes your understanding and comes to be relied on, I guess, when things grow more difficult. Uh, but it's also about the life of the imagination, which is something I'm interested in for its own sake. It says here that the way through the woods runs out in a blizzard that the ocean does not is eternal. And still for a while, you may cross the great ice dome by dog sled, though at your own risk. That the book you are reading is one of a kind, that its door opens inwards and cannot be closed. That the train going over a bridge at night has somewhere to get to, that even the driver, heroic and faceless and bathed in the heat from the firebox never discovers that the sky is a page where with a flourish the birds write the truth in invisible ink and the eye is too slow to be certain that this word and that word are never to meet or the poem will sicken and die that when you glance up from your reading the rivers divide and divide so that at last you step down at a halt in the woods with its name painted over and there in the evening the bride and the gamekeeper wait with their faces averted, wait for the signal to shift and the lamp to glow red and a train to arrive, but not yet and not yet. That though this is August, the snow is beginning. You blink and the woods are half buried and the traveler's gone. And as for the fire and the rose, that it now seems you set out in search of that is a different story or so it says here mm. wonderful um the middle section of my recent book it says here is taken up with a, a long poem of about 900 lines called hammersmith which um if i try and describe it very briefly is a a kind of dream vision of England during and since the Second World War uh, focused through the West London borough of Hammersmith next to the River Thames where my parents met and it's um, well it's all kinds of things but this is the last canto uh, which doesn't take place in the original setting of Hammersmith but somewhere else entirely but at the end, there is a return to the river. And I think it would, I would have to admit that this has something to do with the catastrophe my countrymen have recently visited on themselves for no reason that anybody can establish. And I will say no more about it than that. Hammersmith, Canto 10. At the end of the garden runs a river I will never reach. They walk there in the silence of the intimate, and with the day so vast and patient they have nothing on the clock. I come indoors and light the fire and look up at the flickering leer on the face of Silenus carved over the mantel. The old are sent here from the future to ensure that we despair. Better never to have been, but failing that, stick to aesthetics which in turn will stick to you like napalm to the skin. Thus Ryan. Deep beneath the hearth, a beam is smouldering, ignited by a memory that leaves the city mined with unexploded ordnance, sunk among the bones in flooded graves. 
reading Captain January and Braddock by the fire, I am part still of the done war. The subsequent disaster could be years away. For now, the old weight-bearing beam consumes itself austerely by the splinter in a steady tended rage whose day will come and look like vindication when the stack of stories falls into itself and through itself and down again and down through the final dark river to nowhere for underneath this fury that will seek its own extinction in the wreck of all that stands and call it victory there is no bedrock to be found imaginary england rises for a moment like a gas flare from a sewer and is gone but for the idiots long drowned who thought their fear and rancor and a half share in a shotgun marked them for a war waged underground against whatever was to hand now leave me with the house divided to await its immolation to bear witness there complicit by the fact of being born and drinking from the poisoned well let books and earth and oily water burn likewise the living and the dead but let me remember the possible days the river where the garden ends and those i lost are walking still Uh, ever since my teens, I've been very interested in the July plot to assassinate Hitler in 1944. That combination of um, the religious and the military and various others who couldn't quite organise themselves well enough to pull it off. But I'm fascinated by the climate of absolute horror that followed. Um, and this is the shirt of Nessus as you know, is poisoned and cannot be removed. The shirt of Nessus. He goes out through the kitchen seeing no one, to the woods of boyhood where he means to blow his brains out. This is in July. Among the trees they have anticipated his intention. He is relieved of his possessions but will keep the shirt of Nessus. He writes letters to his wife and to his son in the inferno that approaches from the east then last his old professor now retired to a lake where he is watching barges dumping gold the old man sends his manservant and housekeeper away with thanks and blessings the prisoner sees this sees all the failures of the slow conspiracy soon tanks will cross the vistula he must write his other testament on the insides of his eyelids, hoping that his eyes survive him when his body is unearthed inside the prison yard by those who come a day, an hour too late, but see smoke rising from the earth. It may be so. And then, one autumn day, he wakes inside a state he cannot name, of knowing every scratch upon the iron door, and all the names from which the screams that rise all hours from the sweat-soaked underworld have been detached. It smells, he smells, of burning now. The shirt of Nessus swarms with self-consuming roses. Yes, he writes, although his hands resemble candle wax that drips to seal the page before his book is done, I think there is another place where we might live beyond the lime pits in the baking fields, train after train is passing through ablaze and bound for nowhere. And yet, he adds, black roses coiling from his eyes to wait among the rags of time and to lament must be the only consolation. And on a, a more hopeful note, a, a brief love poem called Rubies. Rubies for Jerry. When I turn for home in the street's black river, fish by clay are frozen, rust and gold, a shoal of earrings over which the rowan berries blaze unfallen. If the street is endless, yet the ice is coming, how can both be true? At your dressing table, 
you were choosing earrings from the box beside the ring tree. Put back the reticent amethyst and let the far off turquoise wait in the midsummer dark at Heraklion. Choose rubies now with drops of gold and wear them always. Um, we've tended, I think, probably with good reason to avoid um, being, as theatre people say, too much on the nose about the pandemic. Uh, and it's interesting the way in which the subject um, insinuates itself into work that you might think was about something else. And I, I, I suspect this little poem, The Desks, has something of that in mind, though in a rather oblique, um, inexplicit way. The Desks. I dream of how, when we have gone, the city turns to introspection, seeking themes and patterns from innumerable instances. Where to begin? Why not the dank accommodation shadows reach beneath a railway arch, or better still, the stairs descending past the nearby offices of lawyers and comedians, deeper than the scope of public scrutiny. The sort of thing I'd choose if I existed, ending in a place, if that is what it is, where no attempt at decoration has been made, with one anachronistic admonition bolted to the wall concerning boiler ash. And next to that, a single door, too wide, too low, that opens on a chamber whose far end is not shown, at which innumerable desks and chairs are aimed, awaiting God knows what examination. And I'll read the very short poem now and then the, I want to finish. This is a version of a very famous old Irish poem that lots of people have, have taken turns with. Um, and this little attempt on it is in memory of um, two great Irish poets lost in the last 10 years, Seamus Heaney and Kieran Carson, to whom of course must now be added the name of Derek Mahan. From the Irish, the blackbird at dawn signing his name on the air with a golden nib. And finally, and thank you for listening, a poem called The Language. Um, this probably isn't the place to start theorizing about one's own work. In fact, I'm not sure there is a place for that anywhere, but um, I think this is about the, the distinction between language and the world my great friend Bill Herbert thinks it's about something else completely, but, um, and rain is the central feature of the poem because we've had nothing but rain for weeks on end really now, apart from the odd bit of snow. The language. Falling through the aspen grove and ushering itself along the gutters, night rain speaks a language you have never understood. Where is the glossary that could admit the drowning air and lustrous blackness or the roaring. All this time you have confused the subject with the method when the thing done is the thing itself and not for keeping. The storm intensifies. The dark is light enough to see the slick rain shining on the slates like an effect designed by God and yet no more designed than all the nothingness your training leads you to infer. Unsayable, sipping at the rims of manhole covers and revolving anti-clockwise down a drain pipe for a laugh. It runs off at the mouth, it drinks itself and with its throat wide open swallows, tasting nothing, neither noun nor tense, insensibly particular, oracular yet empty, pouring from the dark into the dark and still for all his animated talk indifferently bearing Orpheus head away. Thank you very much. 
Brilliant. Wonderful, wonderful. Yes. Sean, I have many questions for you, but just a comment for the moment, and we'll get to the proper discussion later. Uh, I'm very keen to read the cantos, the Hammersmith cantos, of course, and a lot of English poets have written on railway lines. If you go back in history, there's so many of them. Um, the poem is in tercets, uh, and I was wondering what what the the what the sort of architecture alludes to, and long lines. I mean, not that long, but certainly the tercets interest me, and whether the other cantos are also in the same sort of structural uh, pattern. Well, I think the tercet, which has certainly become a staple in contemporary uh, poetry in Britain in recent years, is um, in a sense like the long desired perpetual motion machine. It's never quite finished. It's always beginning. The matter is never quite settled. It keeps accumulating itself. It's not like a quatrain, for example, or a couplet, which implies a, a kind of finish. Whereas the tercet, at any rate, to my ear, to my way of hearing, is kind of open and flexible and well, it seems to suit my purposes. Um, that's why I, that's why I use it. And it's also the influence of, of Dante having translated the Inferno about 20 years ago. It's impossible not to be influenced by that, that compact ever moving verse that Dante produced. Hmm. Interesting that you said dust sets are sort of open ended and not finished. Um, sure, the couplet and the quatrain, you know, there are there, that's an even numbered line. So there's a definite divisibility in terms of mathematical number. But yeah. to me, the, you know, the, the, the odd number lines have a difference. I mean, maybe, maybe coming from a tradition which is, you know, non Western, where um, odd numbered lines are have a sense of completeness. And the reason I say that is because say you have the two polarities, uh, if you take the sort of uh, the old physics um, example of a rod with a fulcrum in the middle, and the moment you use the fulcrum and change the fulcrum, the balance of the rod changes. So the, it always has to be triangulated in some sense, whether it's three or nine. And I'm going to get into this discussion with Arthur's poetry later on, because I see a lot of numerical patterning that is. But it's interesting how I read the tercets and how you as an English, Irish, UK poet sort of perceive the numbers. But yeah, uh, well, I, the, I don't have a rigid view of it. This is a preference, an inclination. I'm not, I'm not claiming that it's sort of it suits some underlying cosmic pattern or anything of that description. It just suits my purposes in the construction of a poem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I wanted to thank you, Sean, for um, as ever being a kind of, I mean, a touchstone poet, but um, this time I really thought about you as, uh, because the you use the word witness comes up quite in, I think it's the second poem you read, that sense of, inalienable kind of clear sight. You know, I think that sometimes people who, people who read Sean O'Brien and listen to Sean O'Brien, you know, there's a question, um, is it poetry that's driven by the concrete? Is it driven poetry that's driven by um, philosophy, by thought? Because, because it does both so clearly simultaneously. I mean, like those, it were the two rails of the railway line. Um, but that, um, yeah, the inalienability of kind of clear sight of integrity is, is one of the things that I think I always return to in your work. And you obviously can't respond to a compliment on one level, but of course you can. So I wonder if you could say something about witness. Um, when I first got really interested in poetry, which is a long time ago now, about 55 years ago, when I was 14, I was very excited by the early work of the British poet Ted Hughes. And I realized when I tried to describe to myself what, what it was that thrilled me, it was the sense that his work left the world more real than it was when he found it, you know, that he gave an additional substance and texture 
to the things of the world and the climates and atmospheres of the world. And that's always been fundamental to me. And that's also somehow that goes along with an, an unquenchable interest in, in history and politics. And as we know, in British poetry, there's a traditional anxiety about when politics gets into the picture that it's felt to be a kind of a dilution or uh, a way of um, bringing impurities to bear on a noble art. I can't, I can't be doing with that. It's life, you know. So, mm. in all its forms, it has to be in the poems, one way or another. Um, mm. And the beautiful doesn't really earn its keep without the crime going on next door, as far as I can see. Mm. Yeah. So it's high stakes reality, really. Yes. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I well, love I love the haiku and also I mean um, in, uh, that's obviously apart from being a note to Shane Bassini and uh, Kieran Carson and now of course you added Derek Mann um, is the logo of the the journal uh, that Kieran Carson used to edit the yellow nib yes, and you make yes. it into the golden nib yeah. and uh, well the reference to the journal and the blackbird, of course, is the logo. And of course, there are so many people who've written on it. It's just really cleverly done, you know, I thought. Um, I don't claim any originality for it, really. I mean, this one is moving at this, you know, at that micro level of uh, the haiku. You're really moving some available parts around, you know, a bit like one of those old puzzles that we used to play with, with kids where there was one less tile in the frame. Hmm. Um, then there were spaces you, and you were continually trying to move the tile into the place you couldn't reach. You know? mm. So it's, it's a sort of, yeah. I think it's, I think it's, um, it's very, I mean, again, just thinking as a listener, it's so rich, that sense of not being, of being incredibly cognizant of like the Irish tradition in both languages, but, but absolutely not being stuck within it, so, you know. So you have the head of Orpheus being swept away by the rainstorms, or down the gutter, and so on. And that, that fluency with, um, and you know, and the Dante, you know, the the Terza Rima, and so on. And it just, it's quite complex, isn't it? That negotiation between um, kind of cultural loyalty or authenticity; those aren't quite the right words deployment even, and uh, not a kind of insularity and introspection. And you know, there's something there that's quite hard placing a particular diction, a particular poetics. Well, I think I find that these interests just, they come up alongside you, you know. You know, you're, you're just going along and suddenly something turns up and you, fi you find it's, it's pertinent to what you're doing. So, you know, you gradually accumulate these things over a lifetime, I think. Um, uh, I'm not really interested in nationalism, either politically or, or in a literary sense either. And I'm not very keen on limitations, you know, saying you can't do this because you're not X. You know, um, mm. I had enough of that in my childhood. It wasn't growing up in... England in the 1960s was not a particularly pleasant experience if you were from an Irish background. You had to put up a lot of crap from people telling you who you were and who you weren't. So I'm, I, don't, I don't have any of that anymore. I don't, I don't do it. Yeah. Leanne, I think, wants to ask you a question. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Leanne. Sean. It's great to hear you. And, um, well, I've to join you because I'm especially interested about this because they depict to extreme important. Uh, I think also to the um, to all this, uh, this award today, and uh, it's a it's a so it's so uh, important. But Sean, uh, when I'm listening to your poem, of course, my my English is not so good, but one line was so touching me. Uh, you say that the river uh, flowed nowhere. And in the poem, if I, if I remember okay, uh, but this was so interesting because uh, just uh, some times ago, I 
wrote about our situation in China, actually I almost uh, had similar sentence, but totally opposite another direction. It's almost like the river flows from everywhere, but toward to us, you know? Mm -hmm. And so this situation of, uh, well, poetically, but also politically, it's we are in certainly maybe find somewhere the history uh, actually almost lost direction or actually we never had any direction. We are actually in this situation, the point we have, we don't know where we, go, we are going to or um, stand still or backwards or actually if anything. Uh, so if you of course know, uh, you've been China, you absolutely uh, see the situation in Hong Kong, and uh, and uh, the uh, all our friends, uh, Fiona, uh, Sean, others you know all those friends, but they are extremely disappointed now in China. And so, after all, it's of course we are we are uh, continue like even last time. Maybe we we are not time to give answer, but we firstly has to find the question. What is the question of the reality? Where is the reality? So, Sean, could you tell me you what you feel? Does the river has to flow to somewhere? Uh, well, it's a river in a poem, Liam. <laughs> yeah, so I can do whatever's required of it. You know, you know, the river you refer to flows from everywhere, and that sounds to me like a an optimistic notion, you know, of a kind of um, an omni Beautiful line, I love it, yeah. Um, whereas it happens that the river at this point in that poem is kind of stalled for various for various reasons, but I, I don't think poetic images should have the force of law, if you see what I mean. It's not definitely X or definitely Y, you know, it's just on this imaginative occasion, this is the way it seems. Um, is poetry not the same as philosophy then? She said provocatively. I don't know enough about philosophy to comment really, Fiona. Um, he said with relief. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that if the river is a concept, then actually it can become quite binding. You know, it steps yes. out of language and becomes life world. Yes. You know, in Leanne's sense, but. Maybe after all, you know, uh, we, if we don't, we can, if we cannot find any kind of a party or left or right, the wings which we, we find belong to or something, then we have to somehow come back to our own language to keep the full life of the language in the creative form of poetry or something. At least we find a stand of the individuality uh, or the, our own individual uh, point of view. I, I don't know, but this is a such strange time. I'm sure other people have lots of interesting things to say about this, but I, I um, poetry is something that happens, you know, that people write and it's significant to those who are interested in it and doesn't mean much to those who aren't. Um, and I've, over time, I've grown a bit suspicious of claims about the significance of poetry. It's very significant to me, and I imagine to everybody who's, you know, taking part in this at the moment, it's pretty important too. But um, we have to bear in mind that it's as vulnerable as anything else, you know, to the depredations of time and power and so on. Um, but that's what gives it, in a sense, its thrill. It's it's not immune, you know, poetry is not immune to history. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Arthur, yeah exactly, Marilyn Arthur. No, I, uh, for me, because I, I write poetry and fiction, uh, there is a big difference because when I'm writing fiction, uh, I'm thinking of uh, the reader. And when I'm writing poetry, I think only of my, about myself. So in fact, I remember when I published the first volume, I thought nobody's going to understand it. Uh, 
is a feeling that perhaps other people have. So you are looking inside. And of course, because we, we are writing from a place and from a body, and uh, you know, so uh, it, it, it is situated, but, uh, but I cannot, uh, I don't expect poetry to mean more like in political terms. I thought, as Fiona said at the beginning, everything is, is political in a sense, but uh, so, so I think it's a good thing to be uh, inside a river, even if they are so small as Santiago rivers. <laughs> I would just add that, I mean, one of the poets who, whose greatest work most interests me is Andrew Marvell, you know, who's an extremely shifty, shady, hard to, hard to track down character. We don't know very much about him. We have no very clear sense of his opinions about anything. But this makes his political work, such as his famous ode on Horatian ode on Cromwell's return from Ireland, you know, one of the major political poems in the language, so kind of completely ambiguous that it's almost as if history is taking shape in front of you and then changing its mind. And the dramatic element of poetry, the sense of the poem as events, I think I would add, is very important to me. You know. Sometimes the kind of marmorial statement just lays something down, but a lot of the time it's a sense of something taking place, you know. And this is also true in his love poems as well, or in a philosophical poem like The Garden. Um, everything invites at the same time as it resists interpretation. So language is a thing in the world, and poetry is a thing in the world. Yes. I wonder if I could ask Arthur if he wanted to say anything in this very interesting conversation. I'm not sure I have a lot to add, but I'm more like seconding, I think, a lot of the comments that have been said. Um, I also am um, thinking of poetry as, um, you know, global, as we're all on one planet and not as um, nationalist movements. And, um, you know, like it or not, the threats we face are, are everywhere and uh, simultaneous. And I do think we, uh, as poets, have a special commitment to language. And I like the, maybe been Sean who talked about the fragility of language because, uh, you know, language is, at least certainly in the United States, been so under attack over the last number of years that to be writing a poem, just to write a poem is a political statement in itself. And uh, I think, Obviously, we're passionate about poetry, and whoever uh, you know, poems reach, they reach, and, and that's great. Um, I think historically, of course, um, you know, you were talking about translating Dante, who threw the popes into hell, which uh, <laughs> I always I've never been able to forget that. The first time I read the Inferno, I thought, "Wow, that takes courage." <laughs> you know, that is really putting your life on the line there. And uh, and certainly, if you think of Yeats, you know, many of his greatest poems have uh, concern with politics or uh, in a way it helped root his poetry. It seems to me his early poems are much more sort of romantic, ethereal, and, and then the sort of, you know, foul rag and bone shop of the heart. Um, I, I think in American poetry, interestingly, when I was coming of age in the 70s, it was, um, there was almost like an unspoken stricture uh, don't make a poem political, because if you do that, you're sort of distorting uh, the poem, or you're overlaying, or you're, you know, um, making, you know, borderline propaganda. But I think over time that has changed and evolved. And ultimately, I think poetry is about freedom. I think writing a poem is about, you know, writing from one's deepest self and uh, resisting any form or all forms of coercion. You know, if someone says, well, don't do this or don't do that, it's, I mean, the poem, one of the things I love about poetry is discovering where the poem is gonna take me and oftentimes shedding the idea of where I think the poem wants to be about or whatever, I discover those who are just like shells or whatever that I have to sort of um, strip off and let the poem really 
uh, take me somewhere unforeseen. And that sense of discovery has to do with spontaneity and, and freedom. Arthur, don't you think, I mean, you mentioned Yeats, and I was uh, kind of curious because when you look, uh, see Yeats's poetry over time, there's a certain point he, you know, obviously he was very influenced by the occult and, and, uh, and those poems, which was significant number of poems which were written around that phase, often I find were miss, um, the critics wrote about it in a kind of, a fuzzy kind of way, not knowing what the occult really was. And I think some of his best poetry and the most complicatedly constructed poetry he wrote was during the time when he was sort of into, well, certainly interested in that. And I want actually to lead you to, because I think I want to come back to your poetry uh, because it's about the three of you really, is um, the importance of architecture and mathematical uh, um, uh, and geometrical patterns, both not only visually, but also on, at a conceptual level. Of course, you allude to I Ching and the Confucian idea of you know, the book of divination and so on. But tell us more specifically about the entire concept of hexagrams and di triagrams, because that is fascinating. Because you know, the multiples of those numbers also become larger lotus-like flowers, 64, for instance. So um, the I Ching, the uh, ancient book of divination, I sometimes do like I do translation when I'm trying to think about what can I do next? What I know what I've done, I want to try something I haven't done before. And in a way, the I Ching is not running from responsibility. I, I see it as, uh, through the yarrow process or the coin method, which is more quick, but they both involve chance of using the I Ching as an ancient text to sort of mirror back, but not just mirror, but also to be a window to sort of see through or see out of or beyond. And in that sense, um, become a transformer. Um, the very first time I used the I Ching was actually, um, I remember very clearly in 1995 when a friend of mine called me and said the misty school poet Gu Cheng had uh, killed his wife and hanged himself in New Zealand. And I had met Gu Cheng in Beijing in 1985 and I was just stunned and I sort of didn't know what to do with that news. And I thought, okay, I'm going to, and it was the first time in my life I threw the coins to see what the I Ching, the Oracle book would respond to. And when I looked up the pattern of the six lines, it was before completion. And I remember reading the commentary thinking about here's somebody who dies before they complete their work. And, um, and as I looked at the six lines, some were solid and some were broken. You know, there isn't time to go into the whole process of divination. Uh, but uh, I thought of sort of solid parts and broken parts and how they create a kind of tension with each other. So the very first poem I wrote using the I Ching as a kind of structural underpinning was this poem called Before Completion. And, uh, and then over time, I've used it just as a way to sort of shake things up. If I notice I'm writing a lot of poems in couplets, um, I think, okay, I want to break it up or I want to try. I want a kind of rigor. You know, you mentioned the word architecture and language. And uh, I'm not formal in the sense of wanting to write, say, a sonnet, a sestina, or a villanelle, but I'm still very interested in the kind of rhythm and pulse of a poem and the phrasing and the use of repetition as a way of layering or creating like a weaver, certain threads or patterns that come back again and again. So in shaping language, I, I want, to me, there's that sort of tension between spontaneity that sense of wanting to break free or run loose. And also that sense that there needs to be some kind of rigor of uh, shaping the language. And that's often discovered rather than like superimposing, okay, I'm gonna write a sonnet and here it is. It's more like thinking about, oh, here are certain patterns of language. Like when I was writing sightlines, I started to see repeating words and I thought, oh, well, what if I give myself the stricture and just play with that where each line picks up a word or word from the previous lines, it creates a kind of architecture. And if the last line leads back into the title, then there's a kind of circle. So 
there's un, an unconventional form of, it's sort of like dismantling and reassembling closure, uh, things like yeah. that. So I'm fascinated by patterns with language and uh, I don't know, maybe that help, hope that helps. Mm. But also the use of one of the, one of the, the very important aspect of your work is the use of white space, mm -hmm. which not that many poets can uh, use it proactively. Perhaps you can talk about that a little bit. Well, I want uh, kind of like a yin yang symbol. I want the empty space to charge the language that's there. Mm -hmm. And I think too often um, a poem can just sort of run on and pile up images. And actually one of the things I want poetry to do is to actually slow down and enact the process or give the reader time to really weigh the language and not just feel like, oh, well, there it went, I'm gonna reread it, but to actually have that space and let the images register or the emotion that's coming through. And that sense of dance with language uh, is really important to me because ultimately it's about um, intensity, focus, concentration, and also that sense when the word is there, uh, Fiona was talking about how there's a lot behind my poems. I see it like almost like Zen stones in a garden where the rock pushes up above the surface. And those are the words, but below there's a lot you can't see, but you can intuit and you can feel from the language that you're experiencing as a reader, there's a lot more behind it. And that is moving the language into its shape. Uh, so that white space is really important. If you took a Zen garden and you just stuck a whole bunch of stones around it, it doesn't look that interesting. But if you, as in Rio Anji, put them in clusters and discover as you walk back and forth, you can never see all the stones at one time, that they're 15 stones and they're positioned in different angles so that as you enter, you can see 12 and at the center 11 and the far end 14. You're experiencing this space in the way that one is reading a poem, one is entering a kind of architectural space or experience. Yeah, that's what you, that's, that's what I, yes, absolutely. That sense that your, um, your poems show us that understanding is something spatial. And it's not just spatial in a sense of the material world is spatial, but the, the, they show us the kind of spatiality of concept and understanding and the process of understanding. And it's very interesting because actually all three of you poets have such different kind of spatio-temporal metabolisms, don't you? I mean, inordinately different, really striking, almost like how do we listen to three different kinds of poetry in an afternoon, evening, morning, whenever it is. Um, well, I, may, I, may I ask one, one question to Arthur? Uh, yes, and then Marilla. So yes, Leanne and then Marilla. One short things because Arthur has this very interesting background because the uh, deeper background with the Chinese uh, back, but also very contemporary American poets. But so recently, um, did you feel any un kind of energy, but from the difficult situation uh, in China, but uh, could be transformed into the creative energy in your poem? I think so. I mean, I think there's so much tension happening yeah. in Hong Kong, in China, in Taiwan. I think the important <laughs> is to not be in a hurry to sort of, um, I think it was Rilke who said, uh, it's all about gestation and bringing forth. I think the important thing is to give it time to, uh, I personally am sort of thinking about dissonance and how to use some of that tension in language. But again, I don't want to rush it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Marilla, you were going to say something. And I was going to say that uh, I agree completely that, uh, well, um, in poetry you create a space. Uh, um, uh, and, uh, well, in my case, uh, my volumes are very compact. So it, it's difficult to understand perhaps three poems from a book because uh, there is a lot of recurrence. So, uh, like what Arthur say that you take uh, our words or, or a metaphor and then it runs uh, across the whole uh, the whole collection. 
So like, for instance, in the, you were talking, Fiona, about the spikes and all this, but it's because one of the metaphors is about the hedgehog, the, it's a grim, uh, grim tale about the, the boy that was a hedgehog. And part is part of the metaphors. So uh, there are a lot of animals in, 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 the, in this collection that you see uh, feeding into each other. But all my books um, have uh, 33 poems. Sometimes this, uh, I am cheating because if they are longer, I make three together or four in a single because the first one had 11, 11, 11. And I like, uh, I don't like even numbers. Uh, so after that, uh, well, uh, and is, is in post that, I don't know. I mean, um, it, it, in, it truly is something that is outside that you can break it this slow. But uh, the thing is that in, in uh, Galician, uh, as in the Spanish, uh, the, um, there is uh, lines are much longer than in English. You can realize that looking at the translation because verbs and a lot of, uh, I don't know, prepositions. So anything that you will write uh, that, that explains, for instance, that are very, uh, in, in Spanish and in Galician, there is the 11th uh, rhythm. Mm -hmm. I think that in English, I see much shorter. Uh, shorter it was line. noticeable during your reading, actually, watching the English, reading the English on screen and listening to you, it was quite noticeable that, you know, words that one could recognize from their Latin root, it took took quite a long time for the glycine to get to them, whereas the yeah, English sorry. got that, yeah. yeah sometimes I, I am, uh, I say, oh, I, I wish I could write in English and it would be much, oh, much no. more easy <laughs> because, because, you know, um, Galician is, uh, has this complicated thing. And also, so going back to the space, well, the space is populated by a lot of, uh, well, metaphors and uh, images, imagery that sometimes is very private or you think is private, that then other, you discover that other people have similar feelings, but also is quite local. Like for instance, uh, well, uh, the, now we are in, in the middle of carnival that is suspended, Galician carnival that is very long. And it, at the, this time, people uh, is eating blood pancakes. So our pancakes, when you mix in the butter, you mix blood. Mm. Uh, so of course, that, when that comes into a poem, well, people know about, about this if they are here. But otherwise, perhaps it's, <laughs> it's not easy. When you put, the, you put the note, and I thought the note looked very oh. innocent compared to the violence of the poem. So yes, it's very. Or, so, or that's very so, it's, so it's a cultural space. It's a uh, yeah. It's, it's a cultural space, and also another issue that is like my, my second volume, Belay and Spring, in Galicia, in this generation now, in, in these last ten or twenty years, is very common that houses that have been, when there have been people living for centuries, are uh, nobody's living there. Why? Well, cu cultural changes and all this, because this is a land like Ireland of immigrants. Nobody was coming in, too poor, you know. Too poor. Uh, so this is a trope that people will recognize if you are talking of a house that is crumbling on uh, if you are talking of where uh, the worms are eating the wood and all this is real. I mean, it's, mm. uh, it's not a metaphor. I've seen this in the house. So uh, it's, it's something that, well, as, as Arthur said, everything is political. So if you uh, write a poem or, or a volume about a house that where, no, where nobody is living, is for Galician people, it means also why people have to emigrate, why, why these houses, you know, why they're rural, nobody uh, can live in the villages. 
and all this uh, has different meanings, not only the uh, st strict familial meaning of, uh, well, people that are mourning their father. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you so lovely. much. Yes, Should thank eat. you. Yeah, um, we, are, we are sort of coming towards the close of our program. So, but I have an important question because many of us uh, certainly are, uh, apart from being poets, also critics, editors, and anthology makers. And um, I, I, I remember a long, long time ago, I picked up this anthology Firebox uh, <laughs> way back. You know, it's it now seems dated, but it's an important document of the time. And also, I see Silk Dragon, um, um, and of course, there's uh, Yan's uh, Lian's uh, Jade Ladder, which was also very significant. Um, so the question to all of you is: When you are making an anthology, um, is it important for you to be inclusive, by which I don't mean that you have to cut the quality down just to include various people. Is inclusivity an important aspect of anthology making? Because anthologies like these come about very, very rarely, and they stay much longer than, say, an individual book of poems in, in, in a kind of a larger sense, in the sense of university or schools and so on. So I'm just curious, because when I was, when I reread Firebox before this program, and it says in a, a poetry from UK, uh, well, England and uh, Britain and Ireland after 1945. And uh, there's so much Black Lives Matter and Black Poets Matter and all that stuff happening. And I was saying, okay, <laughs> let me go back and count the number of Black Poets in the book. And there are like four or five of them. Um, there are absolutely no Asians or otherwise. I was just curious because when I was looking at the time frame, there are lots of British Asian poets or British Chinese poets or British many other poets, apart from, of course, Afro-Caribbean poets who were also significant at the time. I was wondering what made you not include or include them vis-a-vis -vis that particular one. And then we can talk about the others later. 23 Sean. years ago. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess I didn't like the work. Right. Can I just jump in and say, actually, <laughs> the culture was, the poetic culture was very different from British culture as a whole. It actually was, poetry was just a much wider activity than it is now. I mean, I don't think that Sean's anthology then was unrepresentative. I mean, of course, the proportion would be unrepresentative now because the the who's doing what and who's doing wonderful stuff has changed enormously. But 23 years ago, that wasn't the case. I mean, writers came, Black and BAME, BAME writers came much later into British poetry than they did into British fiction, for example. We had this wonderful, you know, eru eruption of Indian and African Englishes, for example, into, into British into British prose, into British fiction, it took a lot longer for that same thing to happen in British poetry. Just wanted to say that as a witness. Yeah, no, no, no. Back I mean, I, I, I see that, but I think the honest answer was uh, good because honesty doesn't come across also, very often. Sir, just as a side yeah, I'm being honest too, though. <laughs> no, 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 in the sense that I didn't like it. Well, if you're the editor and if you didn't like it, that's the fairest answer you can give, yes. The, uh, I'd also point out that at the time, because um, the book, drew quite a lot of attention, most of it unfavorable, as is always the case with anthologies, you know, because everybody would have done a better job than the person who actually did it. Um, the, uh, the, the Welsh were extremely pissed off because you know, they felt underrepresented. And uh, mm -hmm. I was supposed to go on the Radio 4 Today program, the big current affairs morning radio program, to defend myself against the the infuriated Welsh, but fortunately it was cancelled because some big political story came up instead. Though, of course, the condition of Welsh poetry is to Welsh poets a big political story in itself. <laughs> I wouldn't, if I were doing it now, I would do something, I would be, it would be rather different, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Obviously. And there are people I wish I'd put in that I didn't at the time. Uh, and there are others who probably haven't, who proved not to be up to it, but that's the way with that's the way with anthologies. Um, and uh, that's a, yeah. there's a lot more that could be said about it, but there isn't yeah. any there yeah. time. 
Yeah. Only about anthologies in my country, if you were looking at anthologies until, until 1990, it will, it will be very difficult to find uh, women in anthologies. So there were anthologies supposedly about uh, uh, poetry in the 80s and 90s with one uh, woman. So I think now this uh, has been changing. Uh, it's not that there were no, no women poets before, it's just that uh, the, the gays. Yeah, well, in the most influential anthology of the 1960s in in Britain was the new poetry new edited poetry. by Alvarez. Uh, and I think that featured one woman poet, no, two women poets. There was Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I also suspect that you can't really do these things on a kind of, um, on a basis of proportionality. You, know, you edit the book as you see it, or you don't bother doing the book at all. No, I, 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 am, I am not talking about proportionality, uh, but I think uh, at least here is exactly the reverse, is that the uh, people preparing the anthology that were men, they were not seen women. No, 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 oh, I'm, I'm so I'm not understand. claiming there should be you know, I, half I, and half. Or, with the point you were making there, I agree about that entirely. Uh, it's just, you go and look at Rita Dove's Penguin Anthology of American Poetry, you know, yeah. and some very significant poets are completely left out of it um, or radically underrepresented. Um, but that's Rita Dove's view of it. She's the editor, so it's up to her. You, know? uh, you can't please everybody. Uh, in fact, in the case of editing anthologies, you can actually please absolutely nobody because... No Everybody knows better, you know. <laughs> and everybody you've left behind becomes permanent enemies, of course. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> some, some of them. It's not friends yet. Yeah. I wouldn't say that editing anything is a particularly grateful process. Well, you don't edit do anything, magazines then. and end up, you know, with quite a lot of fear. Yeah. We don't want to get into the kind of miser miseries of poetry biz, you know, but you wonder sometimes what people think they're doing in the world when they start attacking books when they haven't actually gone to the trouble of doing anything about it themselves. You know, That's you know. right, yes, yes. So, well, on, that on the other, think, exactly. Yeah. Yes, on the yeah. other hand, poetry itself is wonderful and we've had a wonderful afternoon of yes, morning, yes. evening of poetry. Sorry, Shadi, you were going to say exactly the same, weren't you? Pretty much, yes. I think, you know, just, just the fact that people here are doing it, you know, consciously, just that's what matters really at the end. You know, good poetry stays and it binds us. And, you know, this, 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 this enterprise, Fiona and I, you know, one of the pleasures is just building bridges is such a cliche, but it is, it is. And in this kind of time, and, I, and, and sometimes I feel that, you know, we are reaching more people doing online poetry seminars now, reading now than you ever you would. Otherwise, you know, 20 people, 30 people, if it's a regular reading, you know, unless it's a big reading. So thank you so, so much. And the poetry was stellar. It was fantastic. It was beautifully read. And I think it was such a treat. And fortunately, because we are in the dig digital age, it'll all be archived on the YouTube channel. So once it's uploaded, maybe in a day or two, Dawn is going to send us the final version feel free uh, to share it with other people, students and others as well. So from yeah. my end, yeah, thank you so, so much for joining us. Yes, huge thanks to Arta, to Marla, to Sean, and to Don for driving, Dawn. and uh, to all of you for attending. I mean, what a wonderful afternoon, what a privilege to be part of it. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Good thank night. You. Good night, bye. See you soon, bye-bye. Good night.